Welcome to our talk about running certified uh, PCI DSS workloads in the public cloud uh, on Kubernetes. A short agenda about what we'll be covering today. We're going to talk a bit about us, uh, myself and Marcel, why we're here. A very short what and why of PCI DSS, how we are able to meet PCI DSS requirements using CNCF and open source projects, and then a short wrap-up uh, recap at the end. So to start, my name is Stephen, uh, and this is Marcel. We work at uh, Shiba Phyllis as mission critical engineers, and my background is running uh, back-end services and providing services to customers, and Marcel's background is more in supporting and, and enabling the developer teams that we uh, support. We started this journey around three years ago, um, provisioning our first cluster in Amazon to help a customer migrate from on-prem to, to the cloud. They are, uh, we'll cover them in a bit, but basically they are already PCI DSS uh, certified and part of the task for us was to uh, help them still maintain this while in the cloud. We are also hoping to use this talk to help demystify some of the aura around PCI DSS. Um, when chatting to some colleagues uh, at our company, outside our team, or even outside our company, there's like this aura of specialness or complexity uh, about, with PCI DSS. And hopefully we're gonna show you it's not all that bad. So a short uh, bit about uh, Schubert Phyllis and well, Mission Critical Engineer. So we use this term uh, to describe the sort of work that we do. I guess it's more close to an SRE sort of role, um, but it really matches the, the environments we look after. So we tend to look after like mission critical uh, environments. So these are the, the, the bits of IT infrastructure that's very critical to a company's success. So if this part is uh, not running or functional, then it really impacts that, uh, that customer's uh, ability to operate. And that's, that's what we tend to help them with. Um, yeah, and, I and Marcel and I and some others are in a team that uh, is servicing one of these uh, critical customers with this, with this transition from on-prem to the cloud, and we're going to talk a bit about that. So this customer is called CCV. Um, they're more known in the Netherlands and in Belgium, maybe uh, in the Benelux area, but they are a transaction processor and they are one of two transaction processes in Netherlands and Belgium. So to be very short, if you are making an online payment or you uh, are tapping your phone or card or one of these machines, there's a very high chance that um, you are having your payments run through their system. So while we can't uh, divulge the exact amount of transactions that we're processing, what I can do is quote their website, which says, we make millions of transactions possible daily. So a very short thing about uh, PCI DSS, because I'm sure most of you are like itching to see how we actually do this with the tools. The PCI DSS standard was launched in 2006 and basically uh, was a coming together of five of the big card providers to help set a, uh, well, set requirements to ensure that any company that's processing or storing your transaction is doing it in a safe way. Now, if you look at the why, um, the, the, the main thing here is that um, previously transactions and these records were kept in a physical manner. So if you had a theft or a data breach, it normally meant someone was breaking in or having some sort of physical access to these records and stealing them but the world is changing or has changed and it's all digital. So these uh, requirements are basically to um, make sure you're doing things in the right way, having out the right safeguards. And by doing it, you can also say to your customers, your providers, you're doing the best to protect their data. So what do these goals and requirements look like? We have 12 key requirements, 78 base requirements, and around 400 test procedures. 
And on the right hand side you see six blocks and basically these 12 requirements are uh, like grouped under these six goals. And these are basically like the goals of PCR that um, you, you need to meet or, or comply to. And we're going to talk about how we use CNCF projects to make this happen. So often a question, why cloud, why Kubernetes? So when you're doing your PCI DSS certification, uh, it's all about the scope, right? So if you run the infrastructure, if you run the network, these are things you need to go validate, have audited, make sure it's compliant. And this would give you something called an AOC or an ROC, which is basically an attestation of compliance or a report of compliance. Uh, horrible things to say, so I'm just going to not do it again. Uh, but the, these, these are basically like that, the certified components of your, of your environments, right? So what some of the major cloud providers have done is they've actually done their own PCI DSS assessments. They have their own AOCs, their own ROCs. And when it comes to certifying an environment, uh, we can reuse or reference their AOC in our AOC which suddenly means that the scope of what we have to uh, maintain and audit gets much smaller. And if you ever talk to an auditor, it's always about putting things out of scope. They always talk, how can we reduce the scope of the environment? So I guess the message here is that the cloud is not really a detractor, but not more of an like, enabler when, um, when, when thinking about PCR, DSS, and maybe some other certifications. And then why Kubernetes? So, um, we, for, for our desk, from our history and just from the past, we've seen um, how software or applications are deployed. You start maybe with like an installer or a VM or a container, and these were like, like your portable things, right? Um, but with Kubernetes, we can actually package up the whole thing and make that our deployable artifact. So maybe for another talk one day, but we actually run like an exit scenario service for this customer, where we take the whole Kubernetes environment, go to Azure, spin up an ATS cluster, deploy the whole thing. And because they are uh, overseen by like, the Dutch National Bank, having this exit scenario and this like no lock-in, um, yeah, it really, it really helps, it really helps. All right, so disclaimer before we go on. Um, this is quite a big enterprise customer. Um, I'm going to show, or we're going to show how we use CNCF and open source projects, but to be transparent, there's also some enterprise stuff happening, um, but we're not, we're not trying not to talk about that. So um, just food for thoughts, I guess. We are not uh, quality or qualified security assessors or QSAs. Um, this, this is like a special certification you need to have to certify a PCI DSS workload. But we have been working with auditors and successfully um, made this uh, environment pass the test for the last two years. So we have a pretty good idea of what's needed and what's not, but you know, don't trust our word if final auditor basically. Um, and Lastly, that this will not get you certified. As you saw, 400 tests for uh, controls, 78 requirements. What we're trying to do here is show how you can use automation and tooling to uh, reduce the amount of manual efforts and load you have to do to get your environment in such a, such a state. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass to Marcel. I do want to mention we've got a lot of content. We're not going to go very deep into things. It's really about how you could do this because previously we looked into it and what we missed was like a step in the right direction. So we're assuming some knowledge with the ecosystem and some tooling and well, it should be quite the right. Uh, so first goal we're going to cover is to build and maintain a uh, secure networking system. So as you can see, those are covered by two uh, key requirements. Install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect guard holder data. And uh, do not use vendor supplied defaults for system, which is probably a good idea to start with, even if you're not PCI compliant. Uh, like Stephen mentioned, since the world is 
of transactions is transferring into yeah, the digital world, basically. So we needed a way to protect ourselves. So we see there's a huge increase, like exponential, about the number of digital transactions happening. So uh, firewalling was one of the first uh, things we actually uh, looked into. Our choice for CNI is uh, uh, Cilium. So it's one of the first things we install uh, in, our, uh, in our cluster. It covered a lot of checkboxes. It helped us on multiple way, uh, fronts. We're going to mention a couple of them. Um, basically, installing Celium with the default deny policy ensures that we don't allow internet access to the CD environment and the other way around. This basically, by installing Celium, we already, already covered one of the requirements. Um, <clears throat> Celium also helps us controlling traffic by uh, specifying so we can actually allow only the protocols needed for the applications uh, between namespaces, between pods, using selectors, all the tools and bells and whistles you know from the Kubernetes environment. So this helps us uh, stay in control. Enabling the default deny, uh, filtering all traffics means filtering all traffics. So Prometheus, external load balancer, health checks, everything. So uh, while it is super secure, it's also very difficult. Because, uh, yeah, installing something and make sure it works takes a lot more effort than you would normally do. Uh, but fortunately, we also install Hubble in our cluster. This uh, is also from ESA-VLM from Cilium. It gives us a lot more uh, observability. It enables to monitor Cilium itself by using the standard metrics, but Hubble also gives us metrics to monitor the behavior of the network flows in, uh, in the cluster. DNS queries, drops, flow verdicts, uh, stuff like this. Um, so basically what Hubble does, it conducts automatic discovery of all the service endpoints and grabs a dependency graph resulting in a more user-friendly visualization and filtering of data flows. I grabbed that from the website. What it basically means, we get a very nice overview of what traffic is dropped and what traffic is allowed. Uh, it made it a lot easier for us to actually get all the software and all the network rules in place. Um, additional benefit for us is we also get the access to the uh, Hubble UI to the developers. So even the developers actually now have Hubble UI. At, at the first it was a bit bumpy, but uh, now they actually use it to when they are uh, developing new applications to also immediately help us with creating CNI or uh, Celium network policies. Yeah, so at the beginning of the project, here we are thinking everything was going very smoothly and we were on the right track, making the best and the most amazing platform. Um, but then, yeah, we hit a bump. So they told us that the application need uh, access to uh, on-premise uh, services, which, well, the only solution we had at the time was allowing the entire subnet to uh, the on-prem environment, which as you can imagine, uh, you need to be very specific, which traffic you allow to a cart or the data environment. This also uh, accounts for the on-prem environment, which they also have running with, also has is CD, uh, PCIDs as compliant. Um, so the only, what we did is then we, well, we turned again to uh, Cilium. Cilium has an access, uh, egress gateway. Egress gateway is basically allowing us to route specific traffic based on labels. So for example, for PCI DSS complying uh, or applications, we set a specific label like PCI in scope, and then we can route that specific traffic via the egress gateway, gives us a much more uh, limited way of uh, filtering and allowing the traffic to on-prem. Because our, uh, well, the environment is air-gapped, as you might understand, so internet connectivity is prohibited. This is uh, challenging when running Kubernetes. So pulling containers uh, then becomes quite difficult. So we use our own uh, registry solution. Normally this can also be uh, accomplished by Arbor or any of the cloud vendors. So at the time, at the start of the project, we choose ECR because that was what we were most uh, familiar with. By doing that, we're also relying, I'm gonna try this word once as well, <laughs> at the station of compliance from the cloud vendors, which basically is the document saying that they are PCI compliant with their services. Um, it is not a hard requirement to run your own uh, registry, but it is one of the recommendations. So they have a whole uh, addendum of cloud uh, and Kubernetes recommendations you need to do for your environment. Um, but 
we did implement some of them. For example, we have two registries, one for uh, development and one for production. This makes it so it's less likely that you're pulling in a developer container into your production workload, which uh, has maybe more tools, vulnerabilities, and uh, things in it. Uh, this also makes sure that we have different policies on our production uh, registry compared to the non-production registry. For example, for the modifying and replacing of images, which is uh, something we turned off on production. Then, the other key requirement we mentioned before is to not use uh, vendor supply defaults for system uh, parameters and, uh, you know, passwords, which, like I said before, it's probably a good idea for everyone. Uh, the only thing we have, uh, we are ha highly re uh, relying on Terraform and workspaces, so we use uh, AWS Secret Manager to where we put all our secrets. So we needed a secure way to get the secrets from Secret Manager into our cluster as Kubernetes secrets. Um, what we eventually chose is external secrets operator to sync the secrets uh, to the cluster, which it can do from various backends, uh, AWS being one of them, Azure Key Vault is also the other one you can use, or HashiCorp Vault. Um, so one of the uh, other benefits we actually used by this, it's not really a requirement, but we sync in a secret, and as you can imagine, not all the applications that you are in control with can do automatic password rotation. Well, password rotation is a requirement, so instead of password ro rotations for the application that don't support it, we use an other open source top project, which is Reloader, so the moment we update a password, secret gets synced to Kubernetes, we can then say when the secret is changed, reload the application, and because we wanted to give it a as much hands-off uh, experience as possible. When you have uh, applications you develop yourself with, for example, the developers, you have other ways of actually doing this with the uh, current and previous secrets, but any application needs to be aware of those and you need to be able to rotate these in the cluster. But for the ones that doesn't support, Reloader works really well for us. Back to you. Okay, so talking about uh, cloud holder data, um, there's two parts to this. There's the encryption of the data at rest, and there's the transmission of data uh, in, in the environment. So, uh, naturally, the, the storing of the data itself is handled by the application with encryption keys. But I can talk about how we manage the access to the, um, to the files. So, Tetradon is a nice project that does runtime enforcement. Uh, it, can do, it monitors process execution, you can write policies that allow or disallow access, and there's also real-time enforcement. So, also disclaimer, currently investigating, it's not actually running right now, but we have a quite nice use case, for example, where we are processing our transactions, which we do in batches, we write it to the disk inside the pod, and then we want to send it off to its destination inside the customer network through the egress gateway that Marcel mentioned. And so if a bad actor was able to eject into a pod, there is that small window of opportunity between writing the file to disk and uploading it and then deleting it, where in theory they could maybe exfiltrate data or just read the contents of the file. And so what Tetradron could do in this case is you have a policy that says if you are not this process or not this user and you're trying to access this file, then just terminate that system call. And we've seen some really nice demos in this case where from the outside, like you do uh, like an LS, that's all good. You uh, do a cat and the process just hangs because under the hood, Tetradron has just ripped out that system core and just basically dev nulled that thing. Uh, again, our friend Cilium pops up with the transparent encryption. So where this helps us is the node to node and pod to pod traffic like intra cluster or inter cluster. Um, and this also helps us reduce the overhead of uh, running a service mesh, having to fiddle with that like, MTLS. Uh, you know, there's a whole kind of worms there. And you know, this means that anything into the in, like, inside the cluster is just handled by default with with wide our VPNs. So it's really fast and efficient. And then in addition, any egress traffic um, is configured for TLS. And those are more of a process thing to check that's actually configured in this way. Uh, and as a bonus, any traffic that uh, happens inside the cluster using Hubble is written to standard out in the containers, which means then, then get scraped by a logging solution, which we then push into a seam 
And, uh, well, if we need to do any retrospective investigations, we have all the information. Next goal is to maintain a uh, vulnerability management program, which basically has two key, uh, key requirements, uh, protect system against malware and regular update antivirus programs, and develop and maintain uh, secure system and applications. So the develop part I'm not going to mention here, that's a different team, which they need to take care of themselves. Uh, but yeah, the first one is the uh, antivirus. As you can imagine, uh, Running containerized apps on Kubernetes is not something that we thought let's install an antivirus system uh, on all the containers and in, on the nodes. So we basically looked at what the main uh, goal or aim of this requirement actually was. What it actually tries to protect you against is to run uh, malicious code on the system or uh, any software which basically can tamper with the system. Uh, we tackle this by, uh, well, basically using Kubernetes with the security context. So as you can see, we have uh, run all our containers with non-root. We set the immutable file system, which basically makes it a read-only file system. You can, uh, and we disable some insecure capabilities. Uh, so by implementing all these, we're actually covering the underlying intent of the uh, requirement, uh, which we thought was a much better idea than installing antivirus in containers. Um, other thing you need is you need a process to spot security. Yeah, this could have been a bit smaller at the, uh, that's good for the retro. But, um, so we need a way to spot vulnerabilities. Uh, you also need to assign them a ranking, like high critical and low, and you need a process to actually act accordingly based on the ranking. That pr is a process part, so we cannot automate that, but we do need a way to uh, see the vulnerabilities. The first we started, at the start of the project, we were running ECR scanning, which at the beginning was nice. When I wanted to look at more static environment, we were still uh, trying to you know, install the, all the systems. So we had a good way of whatever was used in the ECR that we needed to patch this. When the container uh, uh, platform was getting used more and more, developers started to use it more and more, there was such a, a, a imbalance between what was in the ECR and what was in the system that was a very high, uh, hard to track if the actually container was being used in the system. So that's where we uh, went to Trivi. Trivi runs as an operator in our system, which basically scans uh, what's running in your cluster and reports this by a, a CRD. We uh, also run Posty, so basically on the, uh, based on the vulnerability, we have an automated, uh, well, yeah, we are all also Yira engineers, so we make a ticket for the process and we need to act on this uh, accordingly. So Trivi scans the, uh, the image itself, the file system, and it can help us find a lot of things like vulnerabilities, licenses, or maybe even passwords or stuff stored in uh, containers. Then, well, uh, we use Renovate because we also need to keep our systems up to date. Well, we all know are aware of uh, Patch Tuesday, which uh, on containers is not something we can do. So we needed a automated way of actually keeping our containers up to date. So we use uh, Renovate as a trigger to see if they're upstream containers or in our registry being updated. So based on the merge request, we can then merge it, container gets built, and we pull it through the system via uh, continuous delivery. And we'll talk about that later when we use Argo to actually deploy this. So uh, then the containers are being promoted from staging F and all the way up to production because we wanted this most you know, hands-off experience. No one likes constantly checking your CV and seeing if there are vulnerabilities, uh, fixes available. Max, you? Okay, so then we're talking about the implementing strong access control measures. And what we're really talking about here is limiting access to the environments and limiting how changes happen, um, especially to the production environment. So how we do this, you know, we also got on the GitOps train and we chose uh, Ardo as our choice, but also Flux and other operators will be just fine. Um, and together with Strong RBAC, we cover this requirement. So we will say to uh, a developer role, basically, that you cannot log into a, you can't exec into a pod. You can't uh, do port forwards. We really lock you down. And we made sure the only things you can do is pretty much delete a pod if you're really stuck or um, push through new deployments or syncs using Ardo CD. So by using uh, a DIP-based workflow, 
We also get um, some things for free. So we're forcing peer approval, so one or two approvers per change, depending on the uh, how you say, criticality of the application. We have the audit logs included and versioning. And so if you ever worked in a uh, highly regulated or compliance environment, the change process is really difficult. You spend a lot of time writing rollout plans, rollback plans, uh, risk assessments, all that. So when you have a version artifact, it makes life a lot easier. Your rollout plan basically describes what you do and stage your non-production. You talk about how you promote nothing through. The rollback is nine times out of 10 rolling back the commit. And then for risk assessments, generally we in the low to medium uh, category. If we're going above medium, then normally it means you should be informing your security team to join the assessments and that will slow down change. So, you know, we, uh, yeah, doing like that. So this image is lifted straight from the PCR handbook for documentation. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty traditional. You have your employee workstation, uh, a DMZ, where you have your admin box or bastion host, whatever you want to call it. And from there, you connect into your uh, production environment. So everyone knows why we do this and why we should do this. Um, but obviously, we want to be uh, as cloudy and container as possible and not run any EC2. And so a project that I've been watching a bit was Container SSH. And Container SSH is a sandbox project that uh, basically launched a new container for every SSH session that uh, you establish. And then once the user session ends, the, the container drops. So again, disclaimer, we're not using this yet, but something being looked at and on the very, how you say, uh, close in the horizon, because in the most recent release, they just added ORDC support, which means that will fall into our ecosystem using an IDP and authentication, AuthC, all that sort of stuff. Now, of course, because it's a, um, it is a container, we can then also apply Cilium policies to it and further restrict what it can do. So even if you get into the container, you're still limited to wait and go and what to do with it. What else? Yeah, so this goes about regularly test monitoring and testing networks. <clears throat> um, we need to track and monitor access to network resources to call our data, and we need to regularly test system and processes. So I don't have to explain this one. I guess everybody in the room knows this. So uh, basically any application we just mentioned has these metrics. So we put these metrics in the system. So here we can uh, uh, check on the security and integrity of the cardholder data environment. So we key requirement here is basically being in control, knowing what happens. So uh, we have a baseline idea of what the environment should look, how all the metrics should look, and this gives us insight because, and also because of the Cilium and Hubble metrics, one of the other tool tricks we can actually do with this is basically when there is an increase in drops or in denies on a specific Cilium policy or flow, we can then trigger an alert. So if we see a huge increase incoming, it's not that easy in Prometheus, maybe Victoria metrics has better tools for this, but that's another discussion. But uh, so the, we need to be basically doing anom anomaly detections. Well, yeah, it is possible with Prometheus, but you are basically doing very difficult queries. Um, the other thing that is required, uh, actually looks quite good, we need to document all our uh, network policies for audit purposes, and we also need to do this, uh, we need to review them twice a year. Um, so Kubernetes has actually made this really easy for us to uh, document this. So basically what we're doing, so we're grabbing all the uh, CNPs out of the cluster and we're dumping it in a Git repo. By doing this regularly, the actual uh, merge request of this dump is basically our, our changes in the network. So we have a very good visual representation, representation of what all policies were changed, if there were policies deleted and what happened. So this makes it very easy for us to prove what happened on a network level. Um, and the being, uh, all the policies being in Git gives us a, a documented way of actually going through them because we still need to make sure that all the policies are valid, that no one actually accidentally put a allow any any somewhere in a list. So we still need to go through this like uh, tw uh, twice a year. Uh, you could of course do this with all their appliances and network equipment, but then with some fancy bash scripting and stuff, uh, this is a lot easier. Um, 
one thing I do want to mention is that uh, we are looking at TestCube. I came into contact with this because of a request from the developers. TestCube is actually a framework to do automated testing for your applications, but you can also use it for, uh, well, us as platform engineer. You can actually check for deprecated uh, uh, APIs, but we can also use it to automate some of our tests. One of the requirements is basically doing a regular pen test to prove the isolation network between the CD environment and other environments. This still is a manual process, but we also know that uh, the human is here also a vulnerability in this case. So we wanted to automate this process and make it as reliable and repeatable as possible. And then TestCube can also store this data somewhere and actually then we can hand this over as proof. It integrates quite well with Argo or Flux or GitOps because you can actually store your tests in a YAML format and just deploy them to the cluster and trigger this based on events or cron jobs or anything like this. Uh, yeah, this is also mine. So maintaining an information security policy. So we need to document all the security policies we actually provide and, uh, uh, in the system. So while we cannot automate everything, a lot comes down to processes in a PCI environment. So that's all a lot of like agreements. We need to document a lot uh, in uh, uh, Confluence or whatever you use as a tool. So we're not going to talk about all these today. What we can cover is all the policies we apply onto our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we chose Gatekeeper, but Kiverno can do this as well. I must say Kiverno made it a lot easier to put the, uh, the policy on screen, because I don't know if you ever tried to put a Gatekeeper policy on the screen, but it won't, probably won't fit. Uh, so we document all our policies, and for example, the things I talked about before, external secrets, uh, if you want to use that multi-tenant in a secure way, there are ways to block this by uh, checking the prefixes of the secrets you're doing. We're enforcing this with uh, Gatekeeper. Uh, allowed container registries with a mutating webhook we're doing with Gatekeeper and uh, the pod security policy. We can actually enforce this. We documented all our uh, policies. So the message is basically prefixed with an idea. So if the message is not clear enough for the developers or the end user, they can look up what actually they need to do to solve the actual policy. So one of the key requirements here is making your end users aware of what they need to do from a security perspective in the cluster. And then by storing all these in Git, we also have proof and documented our policy in that way. Every policy has a documented readme and that covers that requirement. Okay. Yes, almost there, almost there. So takeaways. Um, three things we want you to focus on or three key things to take away. The first is when you're going off on such a journey or uh, starting any new project, do you take a look at the CNCF project list? The uh, projects mentioned there are of a really good standard, considered stable and already used in production environments. Also, take a look at the CNCF sandbox projects, because these, these are projects that are in a good position or good state, so at least going enough to be recognized by CNCF. And like the example of containing SSH, wasn't quite ready, but you know, it's, it's, it's getting closer and closer. Don't shy away from the cloud or Kubernetes, because you know, reusing these uh, service or, or components means that you don't need to. You can just focus on what you need to basically do for your uh, customer or company. And then um, building a PCI DSS environments in the cloud using Kubernetes doesn't have to be scary. So I think if you look at what we've shown today, this is stuff that probably everyone should be doing in a production environment, not just for PCI DSS reasons. The main, re the main difference really is at the end of it, you don't have some sort of checklist or audits to review to basically back up that you're doing what you say. So these are some most, these I think are all the things we mentioned today, if anyone was uh, trying to keep track. So we thought we'd put onto one slide. Um, yeah, check out the project. There's some really good stuff out there. And thank you for coming to our talk. We have three minutes for questions if anyone has any. Thanks. Uh, a lot of practical experience. Uh, one thing I guess missing is ingress. Uh, how are you, are you exposing your workloads? And how are you protecting? Which ingress controller are you using? 
So this is one of the things I didn't want to mention because it's not CNCF, uh, if people are interested. Basically, we have uh, an allow list on the internet that comes through a egress VPC through a network firewall on AWS. And there we terminate the traffic, we do RPS, RDS with network firewall, re-entrip the traffic and send it back into the cluster. And then over there we have obviously the intelligence to do alerting on stuff. Thank you very much for sharing uh, um, all the tools that you've been using to fulfill the compliance uh, um, that is quite quite heavy. As you mentioned, the framework uh, was created in, two, in 2006, so it's quite an old framework, and sometimes the way that it's being framed, the requirements is like kind of difficult like for cloud users, cloud-heavy companies like to adapt to it. So I assume like there has been a lot of efforts to summarize, to rationalize the complexity of, what, of your ecosystem in order to be audited successfully. Um, are there any tips you can share in, in how you manage like, to simplify this, uh, this, uh, this picture to your auditors? Thank you. Yes, so uh, I think Marcel touched on it a bit, but basically you really need to work with the auditor. If you're moving to a new modern environment, using containers, using cloud, it's not gonna work if you just say, here's my uh, assessments, because things like the antivirus and that, it's really about what are you solving? What's the underlying thing? And I think in V4, which is uh, released last year, uh, a lot of that's been addressed, and there's now like a, a, a companion document to help you with container and cloud workloads. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, quick question, how did you manage to, uh, to put your HSM in the cloud, or if you, if you did? Excellent question. So uh, right now we, so the HSM, long story short, is running on-prem, on because we have some custom uh, crypto cryptography, cryptography things happening going on there, and uh, we are waiting for uh, the HSM as a service in Amazon to support these sorts of cryptography stuff that we are doing. So we have a direct connect and we're in the same region and we try and keep it as close as possible. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. We good? Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're still here, but not by the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Cool, thanks everyone. <laughs>